Okay, and in today discussion, the, the three hours of today, um, we uh, will see how to move uh, uh, the execution of JavaScript code that we uh, up to now uh, were used to execute inside the Node environment. Uh, we'll try to execute that uh, in the browser. Okay, so to actually to, to empower um, the web pages uh, with dynamic behavior. Um, we have okay this is the, is the outline basically but to understand how javascript is running the, in the, is running in the browser and especially what is the interaction between our javascript code and the rest of the browser and the rest of the web page hmm. um, so uh, the, we will learn the basic mechanism of, uh, why uh, web pages work basically so the first step of course is uh, loading loading the code in the browser uh, and this is very easy because we just have uh, to use the script tag uh, inside the uh, in any part in any point of your web page the script tag basically could include some inline javascript uh, but we don't like to do that uh, for us it's always better to load the javascript from an external file okay so in, in, instead of writing javascript inside the web page we just refer and we load an external, web, uh, external file. So if you put this tag script uh, with a file, an external file name, uh, remember just the closing tag, uh, anywhere in the page, in the head, in the body, in the middle or something, the browser, uh, when it reaches parsing the HTML, when it reaches the script instruction, will stop for a moment parsing the page, will start loading this file, and we start running it immediately after it has been loaded, mm -hmm. uh, which is not a good behavior because uh, whenever you have the script, you are stopping the, the, um, the processing of the page from the browser. So you are inserting some delay in the loading time of the page. Um, uh, so, uh, so the, but this is the basic mechanism. The file is loaded and it's immediately executed and then the HTML processing continues. Of course, there is a, a, um, a performance problem here. And so the question is, where is the right, uh, the best place uh, where to put the script text uh, so that to minimize uh, this uh, load time, this processing delay, uh, this loading delay? Uh, because the HTML allows the script to be put where, uh, where you want. And uh, uh, especially there are two uh, suggesting that you find uh, online, especially that you found in the, in the previous years. Uh, initially, they told you that uh, uh, the script tag should be inside the head of the document, inside the head uh, section of the document. And it's clean, okay? Logically, you said, okay, these are all the resources that my, my web page needs. Uh, these are the CSS styles uh, that we load in the, in the head, actually. And these are the scripts uh, that I depend on. Uh, but there are two problems with this. The first problem is that it's inefficient because imagine the browser, the browser loaded the page, just received the HTML from, from a web server, and uh, uh, it immediately stops. So it doesn't process the page, doesn't show anything. It will block on, a, on an empty screen until the uh, script is uh, loaded and executed. After the script is being executed, so it will probably register a lot of, of uh, event handlers and whatever, then the processing of the HTML will continue, but only then. Hmm? So the, the user will see a, a page which is just hang on loading. Uh, and the second problem is that this JavaScript will be executed right now when the rest of the body has not been loaded yet. And this means that the JavaScript will see an empty page. If I try to query the DOM to find the elements in the page, I don't find anything. And so uh, I, can, I, I cannot even attach some event handlers, we'll see how to do that later, uh, to some elements or change the style of some elements because these elements are not there yet, huh? are not uh, being loaded and, uh, and the, the DOM is not populated yet. So this JavaScript should, in any case, register something to be done later just because the page is not uh, ready yet. So the solution that many programmers chose was to put uh, the script tag at the end of the document, just before the closing body, the last instructions in the page. 
So in this case, uh, you are first loading all the HTML page, so the browser can start laying out stuff uh, and loading images and doing stuff in parallel. And after we have loaded the static part of the page, you start loading the um, JavaScript, uh, uh, one or more JavaScript files. And they will, act, they will load when the page is already displayed, so there is less uh, inconvenience for the user. And uh, when they run, so they will immediately run, when they run, they already find the page in place. So all the DOM has already been loaded, so they can actually query <coughs> and modify the page content. So this was the, the normal solution. As you see, the, 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 the example bootstrap page, so I copied here the, the page for maybe, let's make it a bit larger. Uh, the, the, the example page from, uh, from the bootstrap library, uh, where we co copy and paste the, uh, the example page, you have the, the loading of the style sheet in the head of the document, but the loading of the JavaScript at the end of the body, okay? And so if I want to add some other scripts, uh, maybe my script, I can add them uh, in the, again, at the end of, of, the, of the body after, after the other libraries. So I can load many scripts uh, and I can put all of them basically before the end of the document. They will be loaded in turn one after the other and they will mm, practically they it's like you concatenated all these javascripts and run all of them in one big, one big file we'll see what this means uh, in an example in a moment hmm? so basically what happens here is that if we have the um loading in the head okay we are stopping uh, here uh, the green uh, flow of time this is uh, of course the time axis uh, um we when we reach the script uh, this parsing of the html will stop here and we resume only after the script has been fetched and executed so the browser is blocked if we do that in the, at the end of the body all the fetching and executing will happen after the html has been loaded so uh, the user will see the web page here of course it will it will interact with the web page, have the dynamic behavior only there at the end of everything, of course. And also this time is more or less the same. So finally, all the operations will be finalized more or less at the same time. The difference is that the user will see the web page sooner and it, it, it will look like the web page is faster um, because some content can be, can be seen immediately. Uh, this was the let's say uh, the, the the traditional way of, of loading scripts. Uh, more recently, uh, they in the HTML5 standard they defined two new attributes uh, that can be added to the uh, to the script tag, and these attributes are called async or defer. So basically, they invented the async attribute for an asynchronous loading of the JavaScript, uh, and then they, they found it's. Uh, it could create problems in some cases, uh, and so they they invented a new one called uh, deferred loading. What a sync does uh, is that the script will be loaded in parallel to uh, the loading of the web page. So actually, we are not stopping the HTML processing, but we are starting a parallel execution where the async where the JavaScript will be fetched from from the server from the network. And uh, in the moment uh, uh, when the, um, the, the JavaScript is returned, so it depends on when the, uh, on the delay of the network, uh, then it will be evaluated as soon as it's available. Okay, so the, uh, the idea is uh, we, are, uh, we start passing the HTML with an async uh, attribute. At a given point, we have here the script tag, script async. Okay, uh, and at this point we are starting to fetch the script. We are doing the HTTP requests, uh, we're waiting for the server, and so on. At a, uh, some time, in, uh, at some point in time, the JavaScript, the, the HTTP request will return, and so we have the JavaScript in the browser, and the browser will, for a moment, stop the executing of the HTML. Not, you see, it's not when we find the script tag, but later on. 
and we execute the script until then and finally resume the processing of the page of course this depends uh, this time here this uh, time from here to there is unknown we don't know how fast the network is uh, to deliver the javascript file so it may happen that uh, my why uh, the loading of the page may be interrupted here or maybe interrupted there or maybe interrupted there uh, or even there at the end okay so this delay could be much longer than the loading or the parsing of the initial html and uh, um, the execution of the code will happen when the code is available hmm? um, so this is the pro first problem the second problem is uh, so we don't there's a sort of uncertainty no determinism uh, about uh, when the code is executed in, of course everything which is non-deterministic can create uh, bugs or problems in our code uh, the other problem is also that if we have if we are loading many scripts uh, okay the they their loading will be in parallel so fetch one script one fetch script two fetch script three and the execution will be immediate after a load uh, a script has been loaded so what happens is uh, if uh, maybe f1 takes longer to fetch than f2 well, I will start it to execute the second script before executing the first one. So I cannot be sure of the order of the, of the execution of the, of the various scripts that I'm loading. And if one depends on the other, this could be a problem. If there are, uh, so we are, we, with the sync, we are uh, um, aiming at the maximum parallelism that we can obtain. Everything is done in parallel. And as soon as I, I have a result, I can start executing that. But it's, uh, I wouldn't say dangerous, but you need to be careful with what, what you're doing. On the other hand, uh, defer uh, mixes actually uh, what async does with what the body uh, loading uh, does. So the, the load that's called the script will be executed after the document has been parsed, but it can be loaded in advance in an asynchronous way. So it will not block the processing of the page, but it will wait until the page is being loaded and parsed before executing the code. And uh, the execution will be in order. So if I'm loading four scripts, uh, I'm sure that the second one will only execute after the first one has been executed, not just loaded, executed. So basically what we have is uh, I have a script tag here again. So it may, yeah, we have the script. The script tag triggers with with defer. Um, the script the script tag will trigger the uh, loading of the page in parallel. Okay, the browser will start loading the page, and when the script is loaded, it does nothing right right away, because the execution of the script will be delayed until the DOM is ready basically until the page has been loaded. And so the script can execute and, uh, and this, we are sure that we are not blocking the parsing of the HTML and uh, we are sure that we can execute the script when the page is complete, when we have all the elements in the page. We have basically the same simplicity and advantages as putting the, um, uh, the script in the body. So this, case here with defer is very similar to putting the script in the body because we execute the script in a in order and at the right time not not before not much uh, not too soon uh, but the advantage is that this fetch time will not be perceived by the user because it will be done in parallel by the browser it's not the javascript code that does this but it's, it's the browser it's browser itself uh, so we'll open a new thread at the operating system level so our suggestion is always to use uh, uh, this syntax uh, among the four solutions uh, using the defer and putting uh, all the uh, scripts uh, in the head of the document at this point. Uh, so since we are declaring them at the top, uh, it's nice and clean, but using defer so that the browser uh, will, uh, uh, will do the right thing and actually execute them at the end of the body. Um, so we can also do that uh, in our you know, bootstrap page where the code was there. 
I can just remove it from here and add it to the head of the document uh, by adding a differ attribute. And be done with that. Okay, there's a simple solution for that. Uh, okay. Um, right. So a lot of word for just the. the, the I, I checked that basically all the browsers since the last four or five years do they they all support this uh, this new sort so, sort of new attribute which is not so new uh, really. <clears throat> okay, uh, Marco JavaScript goes after the CSS load. Um, they are independent actually. They are independent uh, and they are, they happen asynchronously from each other. Okay, so you could uh, put the script before or after the CSS. Uh, it basically, it doesn't matter. Um, the JavaScript is executed when the HTML has been loaded, but maybe some CSS is still loading. So is there no uh, you know, sequentialization between this, this instruction, they, they run in parallel. What we know that is that we defer the different JavaScripts are, will be executed in order, but there's no guarantee that all the style sheets have already been loaded when we execute the code here. Um, so basically, since they are asynchronous, it doesn't matter in the order when you are putting them. Um, okay. Uh, where does the code run? Hmm? Uh, okay, we know that the code will run in the browser. So it means that the browser inside, it has a JavaScript engine running. Okay, that's good. And uh, uh, we learned that every uh, JavaScript file is its own program. So what happens when we have more than one file and we are loading more than one file? Well, basically, conceptually, is uh, in the browser, if you have more scripts, uh, they are all concatenated as one big, field, big file, conceptually, and they all share the same global space. Uh, the, there is a window object, okay? Uh, defined at the browser level, which is the global space. Every name that we define in the global space becomes an attribute of this window object. object. So the browser predefines some objects. Um, some objects are from the JavaScript standard libraries, and they will be accessible through the global object. Uh, in many cases, windows can be omitted, basically. Okay. If we have console, for example, uh, console.log, so console is a name of, a, of an object, uh, technically it will be windows.console, will be an attribute of the global space. But since it's the global space, it can be omitted, so we, we don't need to write window.window. Window every, every time. Okay. Uh, and then, so this we already know is the JavaScript standard library will be accessible inside the browser in, from our code. Uh, we will have uh, uh, some other, and we'll start them, other uh, APIs, other libraries for accessing the browser or for accessing the document. So that the JavaScript may access the document content or some browser features. Plus, I would add uh, also other uh, my libraries, hmm? uh, whatever I am loading uh, after that. So everything will be accessible. Accessible. All the scripts are loaded independently, but they are sh they are sharing one big global scope. Okay. Uh, we will see the first uh, option here, and later on we will make a, a more complete picture uh, when we study modules later on in, in the course. Okay. So the basic mechanism is uh, all the JavaScript will share the same space. Then later on, we will study modules that will change this view and make it a bit more structured. But for the moment, we don't need that, uh, that level of complexity. Um, before going further, uh, there's a question from Bixul. Bixal, I don't know how, how to get it, uh, but uh, the execution of the script can be executed in parallel with the parsing of the HTML. 
you are saying then I won't be able to know which part of the page I can access from the JavaScript or the uh, so the, the exec okay the execution of the script cannot be executed in parallel really really in parallel with the loading of the page uh, for two reasons one because JavaScript is a single thread remember always huh? the, uh, the browser only does one thing at a time network connections are asynchronous because they they just go outside the browser but the execution uh, and the, the, the problem is that I couldn't have for example let's go here uh, I'm here loading some part of the page and this script uh, could be modifying those components and so on so I will have two different threads let's call them threads but in JavaScript you we don't we don't have really them but that are once one is adding uh, element to the page and the other it may be also adding or removing or modifying elements in the same page so what will happen we don't know because it will depend on the execution speed of the browser versus the execution speed of the javascript so this is something that we want to avoid modifying uh, data structure that is being created right now hmm? so this has, not, has never been considered uh, we could potentially uh, execute some JavaScript if that doesn't touch the page, if that, that doesn't need to interact with the page, hmm? but it's really the case. Okay, we could load some libraries, something like that, but uh, uh, it's too dangerous to do that. Hmm? So that it was never considered. Uh, okay, thanks for the question. Uh, so it's all serialized, and there's a moment in time when our scripts are ready to execute. And uh, uh, for example, what I did here was to load this uh, uh, okay, load these uh, scripts from um, from Bootstrap, and uh, maybe I wanted to do also some some my my script that I called example.js, okay. And this, in this example of JS, I'm writing maybe console log. log. Hmm? And how can I run it? Uh, for running it, I need to open uh, the HTML in a browser. Hmm? So I can maybe in, in uh, VS Code, uh, we also have a, a very simple facility that will run a Chrome for us and so it will open a chrome window with the page and uh, uh, where is the console.log going the console.log is going to the inspector console okay so this is the web page, the HTML page. I open the, the, the inspector window. Okay, and there is a console tab that will contain the output from the console of the JavaScript. This is something that we, we can we could use for debugging basically. Okay, so it's not part of the page, it's a, uh, it's a separate console. I can have the inspector seeing all the uh, of the code, of, of course. All the CSS that we already learned more or less to uh, to, to find and to and to search, um, and there was also the possibility. We also have the possibility in the sources tab here to uh, look at the source code that is being executed, and uh, uh, here I, we can set breakpoints and we have the debugger inside the front end. Mm -hmm. So the difference that we, we need to uh, learn is that uh, the code right now is no longer being executed uh, inside the node or inside the terminal here uh, of the um, of VS code, but it will run inside the browser. So all the inspection and debugging tools, uh, we must search for the ones that we have in the browser. There is a limited connection between Visual Studio and Chrome, so that some information from the front end can also will also be shown. You see here in this debug console, we also have a hello, because uh, Visual Studio is uh, with a plugin, uh, it will uh, communicate with Chrome and relay some information here. But the uh, the real game is happening inside the browser here. Okay. 
so we can execute any JavaScript code here, and this will be executed after the page, uh, page has been loaded. We can load scripts from external sources. We can load scripts from local files. And what happens when we load many, many, many different files? I tried, for example, to load the, the JJS library, just for, for, for an example, uh, that we already use in the lab. And we will, you will use that in the lab in, on, on Monday. And so how can we use, for example, the JJS libraries in, um, in our code? First of all, the uh, required statement doesn't exist. We were used to write, sorry, const djs equal to require djs uh, does not work in the browser for two reasons. One is that uh, require is a function that is specific to node is the way in which node is loading the modules. Uh, in the browser, we'll see that in um, we'll uh, usually implement uh, ES6 uh, and it has a mechanism based on, uh, on modules that is different from the modules implemented by node. We, we will discuss this later. And But in this case, we'll use an import statement and not a required function. So we cannot just copy and paste the code that we had there and uh, hope that it works because it will not work. Uh, and the second point is that uh, uh, on the browser in Chrome, we don't have the node modules folder where all the libraries has been loaded. We only have this, this JavaScript file here and whatever other JavaScript has been loaded here. So there is no automatic method for uh, loading the packet uh, the module from uh, node modules uh, because the browser will not know, doesn't know where to find the file, okay? So this doesn't work. Okay. And uh, what can we do then? Uh, we don't need to do anything, basically. Hmm? We could just use uh, maybe today is uh, the JS. Uh, we can say okay hello plus to data format what happens is it can be uh, let's try it first we can run it and it says hello okay this is shown in the console but really really this this re uh, this reload button here will redirect information to chrome so basically it's the same if you press reload here and you see that in the console, we have this new message. So what happens is that uh, we, this look may, may seem strange, okay, if we are used to other languages or to other environments. So this symbol, the JS, where does it come from? In this file, there's no definition. With the require, at least we had to define a variable with the name to be able to refer to the different functions or properties of that object. Okay. We here, we are using a function that is not defined anywhere. Okay, console, we know this is a global object, it's a global property, okay, we, we can trust it. Well, where, where does this come from? This comes from the loading of this script that will define a global name, the JS, and this global name will automatically be available to all the scripts that follow. You can imagine it's not a clean solution, it works, of course, it has always, always worked, but this, that is why we will learn a, 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 a modular mechanism later on. And when we go to React, it's all based on importing modules, but there's a lot of uh, helper code that will, uh, will make it run for, for us in the, uh, at that time. For the moment, we can just trust this mechanism. So whatever a library that we load is defining will be available immediately without any declaration, without any importing, uh, uh, at the JavaScript level. This also makes the work uh, more difficult for the editor because it really, in a, in a, when, we're, when we're writing JavaScript code for the client, uh, inside this file, <laughs> there is no way that the editor, that the IDE uh, can know which libraries are loaded because I'm not loading the libraries here, I'm loading them there. 
so there's a lot of a lot less protection about uh, uh, writing the wrong names and so on um uh Zach Shing is, is, is asking if we load the js before we don't need to import in the example five right yes uh, we, it's uh, it's already available we say it's being imported here in the script and it's immediately available hmm? uh, we should load the library in the html yes it's the only solution the only method for loading a new library or not the loading a new javascript is in the script with the script tag in the html so from a javascript file you cannot load another one right now okay with the import mechanism it will be possible but then we will have a client server solution okay there's a lot of limitations of what we are doing right now because we don't have an, a web server running and so a lot of options are blocked for this reason and we will unlock them next week right um so right now you load in this in the html all the libraries that you need you can copy them for example download this file copy it locally and loading it from locally or you can just uh, download it from from one of the many uh, online sources whether we have the content distribution networks uh, uh, that tend to be reliable and they always have the last, latest versions um how can we show that the browser is not using a function named js that will do something else uh there's no way <laughs> basically um there's no scoping here in the basic javascript in the browser okay uh, and so all the names uh, fit together into one big global space and we hope that the the, the, the library developers uh, don't clash or don't redefine uh, predefined symbols so if you mix and match different libraries there is always some risk that they are overlapping the names so we need to be careful there's no way to be sure uh, from the language point of view this is what uh, modules we solve uh, but we need to see them only uh, next week um the, uh, they connect with the javascript code even though they are not declared right yes uh, they are declared we what we don't see it what the browser sees the browser will see one big chunk of javascript there will be this javascript plus this javascript plus that one plus my example so uh, it looks like i wrote only two lines but the browser is executing 200 lines whatever and mice are just at the end so the definition of jjs will be probably in the middle of, of the code somewhere that will be executed before my code Okay, so the browser will see only one big JavaScript code to execute, and all of that all together. Uh, we, we must trust that the code before us uh, uh, defines or declares the, the right variables. Hmm? Um, for example, if, if you can also go and see, because we, we never would like to trust something. If I open this file, you see that this, okay, this is minimized JavaScript, so it's not uh, uh, easy to read, but it's defined. This is the whole DJS library without plugins that has been minimized. And uh, somewhere is defining here. DJS uh, is here and okay, here. Is, is defining some property here. Yeah, it, 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 it's totally impossible to read because uh, uh, we, we, will, we will need to, to see the source code here. But it's defined this symbol here in a strange way because it's a sort of function that will be executed. Let, don't, let's not care about this, okay? How, how it's defined, we, we will never read it. If you want to read the, the source code, go to the GitHub and go to the source code, not the minimized one. But just to show you that we are defining something inside, uh, inside the browser, okay? Uh, inside the, the same context. Okay, uh, about the speed uh, of where do we load the libraries, uh, um, it depends. Uh, we, you could download every library into your own project and load them locally or uh, or point to some uh, cdn the, the cdns are content distributed net distribution networks 
uh, that al always holds the same code. Uh, the question is, uh, which one is faster? It depends. Is your website faster than the CDN website? We don't know. Okay. Uh, let, don't put yourself in the condition of being the author of the web page. Imagine a website that is being visited by another user. So that other user will load the HTML from your site, of course, and then we load the JavaScript either from your website or from this CDN distribution network. So which one is faster? So it doesn't need to be close to the, to the HTML. It needs to be close to the user. So in many cases, the CDN is faster than your own server. Also, it will relieve your server from the additional uh, burden of processing uh, power for serving all these requests. Third, it's very likely that if you are using a, a common libraries like you know, jQuery or Bootstrap, your user will already have that file in their cache because they visited some other website before that is using the same library. So in that case, you don't even have to load it because the, your user will already have the library in the, in the cache. So CDNs usually are, are better. Of course, uh, the only catch you pay is that your configuration will depend also on the availability of some external servers. If you don't want to depend uh, on, on other services, you can also copy them there in your, in your, um, in your project uh, and guarantee that you are fast enough for your customers. Hmm? Um, okay. So uh, right now we have uh, this uh, code running in the browser and the code is running at the same time as the user is uh, interacting with the, with the content, with the page content, okay? So um, what is the mechanism for, for the execution of this code? Um, basically all the code, uh, aside from after loading, I would say, uh, the initial loading phase is uh, more or less sequential. After we finish loading everything, uh, things start working uh, totally uh, asynchronously, in a totally asynchronous way, based on the happening and the, on the handling of, of events. Um, the browser is continually gen and continuously generating events uh, whenever something happens, a new event is being, has been, is generated. So you move the mouse, an event is generated. You click the mouse, an event is generated. Uh, you start loading a, an image, an event is generated. You finish loading the image, an event is generated, and so on and so on. You have hundreds of events at any point in time inside the browser. And every event will be uh, handled in one of these three ways by a predefined handle or by a user defined handler. So uh, when you move the mouse um, over a button, for example, the button will change a bit its color, its shadow to see that, okay, I'm ready and ready to be pressed. Okay, there's a visual effect. That visual effect is implemented natively by the browser, which knows how to deal with the mouse movement, the mouse location, okay? If you click on a text field and the cursor will go there and start blinking inside the text field, this is the browser that is handling that click event, okay? On that specific HTML uh, um, element. So many HTML elements already have a default implementation for the handling of various types of events or we can define our own event handlers in our JavaScript code. So we can replace or augment the basic uh, capability of the browsers with our code that will be triggered, will be fired when an event happens. Or the third case is that the, the event is just lost, okay? If I'm moving uh, the mouse over a, a part of the page where there are no features, all these events will be discarded and thrown away. Okay, nobody will see them because there would be no uh, event tender associated with those. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, events happening, a lot of handlers firing, being triggered, all of that in parallel. But uh, JavaScript is not a parallel language, it's a single threaded language. So how, how does this fit together? Well, it fits thanks uh, to a mechanism called uh, the event loop 
Uh, basically, the JavaScript interpreter is uh, always executing a very big loop over and over again. And uh, at every time an event is generated, is uh, headed or uh, sorry, an event wants to trigger an event handler, this event handler is not executed in parallel, is not executed right away immediately, but it will be stored into a message queue. And this message queue will contain all the list, the queue, of uh, um, events that need to be processed, of event handlers that need to be executed in order. Now, all the asynchronous operation will just uh, form a line there and wait their turn for being ex executed. And this message queue will be pulled, so I will check if something is there when the main thread is idle. The main thread is the main synchronous thread of, of JavaScript. And it is idle practically always, hmm? let's say always or nearly always, because after we load the page, there's nothing that we should do synchronously. So after the end of the execution, we have nothing more to do. We are just waiting for the asynchronous thing, uh, things to happen. Um, Giuseppe Jeff is asking also if uh, we are re redefining the predefined behaviors or we are, uh, say, uh, adding our own handles to the predefined ones. It's our choice. We can do both solutions. Okay. Uh, by default, we can add a new handler and we can let the event also be processed by the other handler. We can ask, have also more than one uh, user defined handler running on the same elements. Uh, we'll see a mechanism very simple. Um, Okay, so uh, this, this picture tries to help us understand uh, how, how it's working, how the event loop is working, okay? Uh, so we have the JavaScript interpreter. We have a um, memory heap where all the objects go. Okay, no problem. When we create a new object, it goes there and a new array or whatever, and we can use them. And then we have uh, uh, the synchronous part of the code execution, the, so the call stack. So a function, uh, function main, uh, sorry, what, what am I doing? And sorry, let's see. Uh, so the, my, my function main that uh, called uh, another function, uh, I don't know, compute. Uh, and the other that is adding to the list and the other is uh, creating a new object a new task or whatever and so we have a function that calls function that calls function and so i right now uh, i'm executing for example this check function that checks whether a new task can be added or whatever and this is the currently executed function so javascript will run this code here until there is some code to execute when a return from a function, this will disappear, doing a return from there. And this at least may make a new call for another function. So a new one will be added to the stack and so on. So until there is something in the call stack, the JavaScript will execute dot that code. If this code schedules or some other external event schedules some uh, asynchronous operation. So we create a promise or with uh, trigger or some events has been triggered, it will be loaded here in this callback queue. And they stay there. When all the synchronous calls complete, so there's nothing more here, it's empty. Okay, so there's nothing synchronous to be done. So we take the first, uh, we, we pull the, the, the event loop, we'll pull the queue, the callback queue and say, okay, which, which, which is the first one? The first one is the handler for this event. Okay, right. Let's put the handler for this event here. So at this point, uh, we have uh, this code that has been deleted from uh, the queue, and uh, we have it here on click. Okay. Um, and this function, this will be a function. An event handler that uh, is an asynchronous a callback, like call, call it as you want, a promise code, a callback uh, is the same. It's a function that starts executing right now. 
and it may call other function a and it may call b it may call c and this, this will return and this will return and so on until also this method will return so the call step will be empty again at this point we just pick the next one maybe in the in the meantime we also have new handlers or new promises or new callbacks that are being uh, added to this queue we take the second one the onload handler and we start this process again okay so we have a mechanism for executing a function call basically this function may call other functions in a normal stack mechanism when this function returns nothing more has been um, needs to be executed right now and so we pick the next uh, asynchronous events from there so this tells us that only one function is being executed at a given time only one function and when the executor of a function ends uh, the next one that needs to be executed asynchronously will be picked and executed synchronously okay it's a, a collaborative multi multi threading here there are no real threads uh, there are just uh, different parts of the code and everyone relies on the others to finish to finish soon probably okay so we try we always try to make uh, uh, event tenders very short or very quick to return if there's some work to do let's schedule it for later like create promises create asynchronous callbacks so that they will pile up and they will not stop the processing of other tasks that we may have in the same time okay um okay so this is the mechanism that all javascript is using the events in the queue are not being executed until the call stack is empty andrea yes exactly like that i'm, I'm polling the event loop only when the call stack is empty it's uh, it may seem strange you may say okay but I, so i never being uh, i will never execute these uh, events no the the fact is that in most of the cases this call stack will be empty in most of the cases in most of the, for most of the time uh, will be empty so we will have an empty uh, call stack and an empty callback queue then something happens we are filling immediately the callback queue and we are processing all the asynchronous behaviors and then everything again we will uh, um, the browser will again uh, go wait in a waiting state until something happens mm -hmm. um, so the event loop is able to manage the, the needs and the mechanisms for both synchronous and asynchronous code asynchronous in the way of javascript uh, so we have whenever we call a function this function is just pushed to the call stack so that it can be executed right now if we schedule an event from our code like for, like for example a promise or uh, or from the browser like a, my mouse click then the call is not put in the call stack but instead on the message queue that's it at any step if the call step is not empty we use a we execute the next function in the call stack otherwise we pick the first one for the message queue and the, the rule is is always that uh, a function is never interrupted and so if a function runs forever it will block the entire application it will freeze your window hmm? um, marco after the main thread is finished we'll also a single function event at the time in the call stacks in the call stack has to be empty before rechecking the event loop we'll always have a single function event at the time at the time in the call stack initially you you know um you if I got your, your question, uh, let's see. So we imagine this is empty. Uh, so you, we can pull the callback queue and say that the next handler to be executed is a on click handler. So it, at this point, we only have one function in the call stack, but this function may call other functions. And so this call stack will grow if i'm calling other you know library function uh, or or user defined function or whatever okay so it may grow normally when i'm calling other functions in in the library and then we'll step by step will be emptied again uh, so basically the, the main function is not a, a real special case it's just the first one to be put on the main stack uh even if the call stack contains an asynchronous function nothing from the message queue is executed until the call stack is emptied yes 
what we call asynchronous uh, is not uh, uh, in parallel but we is uh, as soon as we have time to do that hmm? as soon as the main thread is done so if um, from the example that we are doing the chart with db.all db.all uh, will not start uh, the query right now hmm? it will start the query when we when we finish the function in which we are calling it so it's actually a bit more de delayed than that so when we run something asynchronously we should hurry to close our function so that the asynchronous code will start executing okay um okay so uh, this is the mechanism for for execution so we have uh, many snippet many functions that will be called and put into a line and we execute it one by one hmm? Uh, so there is no real risk of damaging some object content for asynchronous uh, contentions. Okay, the only one piece of code is running at a time, until uh, and the only way to stop the execution of this code and start executing something else is uh, returning and exiting from the function. So there is no big risk here uh, of of uh, corrupting object, corrupting the memory. Okay, what are the uh, objects that we are that our JavaScript is um, is allowed to access? Uh, we saw here that we have some objects. Uh, okay, the, the library. We have some objects from the browser and some objects from the document. Let me just say a couple of words about these uh, objects here, and then we have a break. Um, so the browser uh, uh, gives to the JavaScript code. The, um, a set of objects uh, that can be used uh, to interact with the browser itself. So there's a global object called window that contains some properties that we can use uh, uh, to uh, interact with the browser itself. So resizing the window, moving the windows, uh, changing the, the, um, the location of the page, uh, uh, checking the history, so going back uh, in the history, pushing some data in the history and so on. So uh, there are all mechanisms inside the browsers that are exposed to the JavaScript in a standard way. This uh, uh, is uh, called the uh, browser object model, BOM. Hmm? Browser object model uh, that um, every browser gives you so that you can interact with the browser windows themselves. And then we have the document object model, uh, no, a big object called document that will give you access to the to the document itself. So the BOM contains uh, these main objects, uh, maybe history, it can be will useful. So when you go back and forward, we have a list of locations that can be accessible to our page. So we can know which, which was the, the, the page before this one, or we can also manipulate the history uh, in the browser with our JavaScript code. Um, we have a, a, a storage. So the browser offers some storage to web pages. So if you want to store some data uh, on a web page that will be maybe uh, used later on, we can have our own collections or we can store them into a local storage. Local storage is just a, a name value storage. So it can give a name to an object, sort of a dictionary, basically. Uh, we can give a name to an object and store it into the browser. And there's a, a couple of set and get and find the functions, nothing, nothing fancy. Um, the, the difference is that uh, the local storage only um, stores uh, data forever, uh, but session storage only stores data uh, until the end of the session. So when you close the browser, that data is deleted, while local storage uh, tends to remember that until it expires or until you delete it explicitly. So you can start, this, this is the way when uh, you return to a website, they will they recognize you. How can do that? They store some information to the local storage and uh, so they can pick up some maybe login credential or login tokens from a previous session. And they when you open the website, uh, they just immediately recognize you and put you into a logged in state because something is stored not in the page, but in the browser itself. In the, it's a memory inside the browsers that is available to the JavaScript code. Of course, every JavaScript code can only access their own variables. So I cannot read the local storage from my JavaScript. I cannot read the local storage from maybe the Amazon or a Google website. So internally, these are partitioned according to, to, the, to the domain. And there are some methods that are also offered 
by the um, by the browser itself, uh, like some uh, all these setting interval, clear interval, set timeout that we already saw in Node are also implemented in the browser. And the key elements here are the uh, event listeners uh, methods that, where we can add a new event handlers for the various events. Okay, so where we are attaching, uh, we are telling the browser, okay, can, dear browser, when something happens, when, when I click here, I want my code to be executed. These are the function, add event listener is the function for defining user defined event handlers. It's provided by the browser because it's, uh, it's, it extends basically the event handling mechanisms predefined by the browser itself. So it's a browser that, that, uh, that delivers this. Mm -hmm. So we can add specific handlers to specific events. Most of these events will happen in the DOM in the document, okay? Um, but this is the key function that we, we need, maybe the most important one, okay? Um, uh, okay, this is uh, just a slide with some example of this uh, local storage or session storage. You see that they are just used as associative arrays like objects. Uh, we use the window dot local storage, and then these objects can be uh, just accessed by like with a um, with a, an object syntax. Okay, we uh, store with a name any any given value, and we can have it later. This is only useful if you need to store something that you need in a future web page, not in the current one. Otherwise, you just store the values in your code. Mm -hmm. So it can be this can be useful for, useful for for this reason. Okay, so these are basic. Okay, the, the browser uh, object model is more complex, but we are not uh, doing uh, we are not interacting a lot with that, so we don't go into into details. Only the setting the event handlers and sometimes the local storage can may be useful so that, that those are the only two <laughs> topics that they left uh, in the slides um, the next step uh, and will be a big step is uh, to interact with the web page so with the with the famous dom uh, we already know that all the web page is parsed into a tree and this tree is called the dom maybe we have a picture like this here we already shown this picture we already saw that this tree representation is uh, crucial for understanding how style sheets work, where the sheets are applied uh, onto the tree. Okay, but today we'll also see how the JavaScript will see and will be able to interact with this uh, data structure. That is the core, actually, of the behavior of the web page. Mm -hmm. So, but before doing that, uh, I suggest uh, having uh, no, sorry, it's nine thirty, not ten o'clock. Okay, so I, I I misread the time. So we can start, sorry. I was ready to do the, the a break, but it's, it's too early. So we can start uh, uh, already studying that. Um, okay, so the, the, re, the real library in for with which we are interacting is actually this uh, DOM, document object model. Uh, we will try to, again, touch the main points that are of interest and maybe play with some examples. Uh, I will I'm giving you the link to this tutorial, which I found uh, of the right, uh, let's say, uh, complexity and the right level of detail for us. Okay, it will tell us everything we need uh, about uh, the manipulation of the DOM. We will only do some some focus here because mainly because uh, when we go to React, uh, we will ma be man manipulating the DOM in a in a very different way. Okay, right now. We are just start, uh, learning the basics today and Monday on, on the labs. Also, we will learn how to do, how to manipulate the DOM in, in basic JavaScript. Then we see, we probably will appreciate the problems. What are the difficulties uh, in doing that? And uh, uh, we will appreciate that uh, React will make our lives uh, uh, much, much simpler, okay? But uh, I suggest you at least to have a, a quick look uh, through this uh, um, this uh, document, hmm? which is not very long, but it's easy to read. The DOM itself, uh, again, is a, they call it again a living standard because uh, there is no fixed versions. It's in continuous evolution, and the browsers are continuously uh, implementing more functionality, more or less functionalities uh, uh, across uh, this set of specifications. Okay. So it's something which is uh, again 
uh, very complex and very evolving. Uh, with the JavaScript, uh, I can read and write the DOM objects, basically just through the an object which is called document, which is a global object document. Okay. Uh, and through this document, uh, I have access to all the data structure in the page. I can access all the data content, all the elements. I can uh, see the classes, the styles. Okay, I can add the nodes. I can remove nodes. I can change the content of the nodes, uh, whatever I want. Everything that can be done by changing the page, by changing the HTML, can also be done in JavaScript, hmm? just by programming the DOM. What are the types of objects uh, that we have here in, in the DOM? Hmm? Uh, the main object is, called, is the document, of course. Then, uh, which is the, the represents the, the tree of, of the document itself. Okay, uh, represents the, uh, the whole data structure. This data structure is composed uh, basically of three types uh, of nodes. These three are the most important ones. Uh, and all of these are so-called nodes. Hmm? Uh, so we have nodes of type element, which are the text. So uh, for example, a P corresponds to a node of, the, of, of an element type of type P. An attribute is a, a node of type aptr, aptr, it represents an attribute. So um, when we have source uh, equal to example.js, I don't know, or, or jetpack, okay? This is an attribute and we represent it by a node that will encode the name and the value of the attribute itself. And then we have the nodes of type text that contain the plain text. So if we have, a, for example, a paragraph uh, when they say hello, slash p, I have two nodes, one an element for P and the other is a text node for the content here. Okay, so all the page is break is broken down into these nodes. And of course, we have a, a relationship that the attributes are only part, are only allowed as part, as children of elements. And also text nodes are only allowed as children of elements. And elements uh, can also be children of other elements uh, in the normal nesting of elements. So I can have a, a, a span inside the div, inside a, an article, inside the body. Hmm? Uh, so we have a normal nesting of elements uh, inside elements, inside elements. Uh, and uh, at, the, at the bottom level, every element may also have one or many uh, attributes and one text. Uh, child that contains that the the, uh, the actual text of the document itself of the of the element itself okay so everything is broken down to these types of, of nodes they are all uh sort you see the text element and comment are all subclasses of a general more general concept called node uh, and of course uh, the element is a, gen a generic term and uh, we have many actual types uh, of elements uh, depending on the various HTML tags. Mm -hmm. many, every, each tag is, is represented by a specific uh, object uh, in the DOM. Um, so these are the main objects. We also have a data structure, which is called the node list. And node list is a sort of an array for containing nodes. Okay. So uh, if uh, whenever the API, the functions, have to return not just one node, but a set of nodes, they will return a node list data structure that will behave basically like an array, hmm? very similar to, uh, to an array. It's not a, a simple array, it's just an object called load list. And, but we have the length property, we can access uh, the elements uh, with the item method or just by brackets. Uh, we have the for each iterator, we can iterate with for of with the content, so it's very similar to an array, uh, plus some other maybe easy to, to use uh, uh, functions like having all the keys, uh, all the values uh, in the data structure itself. Mm -hmm. um, 
so it's a it's a sort of an array a bit a little bit more powerful than a, than a normal javascript array and this is the normal data structure returned by the uh, with the dom functions so what can i do uh, first of all uh, i can use the dom methods for finding elements in the page so manipulating the dom means first finding an element and doing something with that finding an element uh, may use many different methods i can find an element by knowing if i know its id if i know a tag name so maybe for example uh, sorry p will give me all the paragraphs called uh, all the paragraphs in the in, in the page and you see that we have a s here get elements plural and so it will return a not list a list of of nodes that will match this tag name so all the p's all the divs whatever or I can get all the elements, plural, if I know the class name. Or more in general, I have a more general method which calls query selector and query selector all that just receive a CSS selector. So in this case, if I can use, I create a string like, okay, I want uh, the ID ABC. So I write you a query selector and it was like we are doing css is the exactly same syntax and the dom will search for one or more nodes that will match this css selector and the difference between these two methods are that the first one returns only the first node so if i have many in this case it's an id so it's not the case but if i write uh, uh, for example body it will give me the first element that will match body. Of course, there's only one, uh, but it will be faster because I already know that I need one. Uh, or query selector all return a lot, not least because I'm assuming that this selector uh, may be a sort of a dot danger, I don't know, uh, or dot information. I assume that there will be many elements in the page with that, that class name. And so I, I want all of them in a list, in a node list. So with these uh, um, methods, I can have access to the individual's uh, nodes in the page. And this will be, they will return me a JavaScript, uh, um, a JavaScript uh, method, um, Sorry, a JavaScript object uh, that I can use to access the properties of the object itself. We can also see that in, in the browser, for example, here we have a very simple web page. In, okay, in the in the console we have all the elements. We only have one H1 basically with no classes, so we should make it more complex in a way. But we can also uh, try document dot uh, query selector, for example, or, or get. Uh, elements by tag name for example the h1 okay it will give me a, a collection of uh, only one element or oh, sorry which is this h1 element itself so i can store it uh, uh maybe uh, let uh, h1 the title remember this and i can show the title it's you know a collection the first two element of this collection will be the h1 element for example that will contain this text so i can easily search uh by tag name by css selector and so on the element that i want in the page uh, once I, I find out i found it i can modify it or can i can query it so maybe i can uh, know about the message that is written by querying uh, my title zero dot uh, inner text for example and inner text is a is a property that 
concatenates all the text nodes of the of the specific element so if i click message i will get the text that is contained into that uh, element um marco is asking if we can concatenate these methods uh, some of them yeah, because basically document uh, the, these are methods of the document uh, no, uh, object uh, but uh, uh, we can also many methods also work on element nodes okay if if you have a, a method that will return an element you can uh, concatenate all of them so we can uh, uh, maybe uh, in this case the html is very, very very simple so make it let's make it a bit more complex uh, so let's have uh, h1 that maybe i have uh, um sorry i can put the container since we have in bootstrap uh, class uh, container okay and we have a title we can have a header and then we, we can we may have the the main section with another h1 main section for example okay let's format it so i have two h1s in one inside the header and the other inside the main okay so uh imagine i want to um extract this text here or i refer to this element h1 okay and so let's do this in the in the javascript code so let's comment what we did before and uh, we want to find this this element here in line 33 so we, i can do that in many in many different ways i can say try to select all the h1s in the in the page and pick the second one i could do that uh, let uh, uh, title uh, page the article title equal to document dot get elements by tag name with the tag h1 and then i pick the second Or I could uh, uh, use a selector, select article title to <laughs> is document query selector. They will, uh, where I say the CSS selector for finding that element. And this is easy to find because it's uh, an H1 inside the main. or i could first article title three first find the main section and then inside the main find h1 so i'm first asking the body the document where is the main it will give me the main and once i have the main uh, i ask him the main element among your children what is h1 do you have an h1 so in this case I, you could do like uh, finding document first let's find the main get elements by tag name let's find the main let's pick the is this is a node list so i need to first pick the first one now i have an element and they can ask this element to find their children of tag h1 get elements by tag name h1 and then i get the first these three should be identical should return the same let's try Let's try to save this and reload it in the browser. Uh, sorry, let's run it. So 
So in the console, you see that we have three. We are printing three times the same object. So they're referring to the same object. Okay, we are all finding this element here. Okay, uh, there are different ways. Just exploring and searching. Um, of course, many of them are more or less readable. I think. Uh, this one is the most readable of the three. Maybe it would be, would be more readable if I put an ID uh, okay, here, then it would be much easier to find this uh, like main title and say, okay, I want you let article title for document dot get element by id and type and there are different ways um alessio was the, the difference between get elements by class name and query selector all is that the query selector all can use any css uh, syntax so it can combine uh, maybe h1 dot class dot uh, uh, I don't know, uh, info or whatever you want. Okay. Any CSS expression in the query selector by class name, only classes can be selected. So it's a subset of, of the capabilities. We can only use a, a list of classes to be selected, not IDs, not other more complex CSS syntaxes like children or, or uh, nested or something like that. Okay. So basically the, the more general, I would say, the more general one is the last one. This with this you can do any, any, whatever you want. You can search by ID, by class, uh, by nesting of the elements, uh, by attributes, uh, or whatever you want. Okay. Um, historically, the first the, the four first ones were in the first version of the DOM, and more recently this one were added. Okay. Like uh, uh, when we only had this one, it was a bit complex, no? Because you have to find the elements and then ask the element for children and so on. Then a, a very famous library called the jQuery was invented that uses that popularized the idea of using CSS for selectors. So it was very easy to write something like dollar, which is was the jQuery function uh, main h1 like we did there and it gave me a list of elements uh, uh, selected by css so a lot of people were using this library because it make very easy to select elements and uh, in the later iteration the in the dom standard we added or they added these uh, query selectors uh, that work on css because a lot of programmers wanted to think of that and so right now jquery is used is still used a lot but less than before basically because the DOM is now clever, clever enough to give you, let's say, uh, methods that can be used uh, with, with more easily. Hmm? So the second one, these are more recent uh, and they are more powerful. Um, Alfredo, this is the next step. Uh, what can we do with this element? Okay, is the next step that we are going to see. Uh, so uh, Pietro is the order of the elements in the node equal to the order of the elements in yes yes the order of the in the in the, do, the elements found or returned by these functions is always in the order of the html so you can rely that the second one that is returned is the second one that, that appears in the code right uh, <clears throat> okay um, the query selector can be used even the csf file is not defined yes of course Okay, we are using the CSS engine inside the browser, but we don't need to rely on any CSS files. We only need this uh, document is only the HTML. Sorry, document. Remember, document is the HTML. We don't need or we don't want or we don't see the style, the CSS styles. The CSS style will be used by the browser for composing the page, for showing the page. But the JavaScript code doesn't rely and doesn't need or doesn't see the, the, uh, the, the CSS code, the CSS rules, okay? 
we just use the CSS syntax as a simple way of telling the document which are the nodes that we want, right? Um, and the, 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 the question, the off topic question of uh, available is say uh, that uh, isn't JavaScript a bit scary given the major control all this external code has on pages and events? Uh, you are free not to use the web. <laughs> but uh, uh, yes, once you, uh, you put some JavaScript into a page, uh, that JavaScript can do whatever it wants over your page, okay? And impartially also over your browser window. What it can do is to access documents of other pages. So if you have more tabs open, every JavaScript can only access its own document, not the documents object of, of other pages. But uh, in that page, you can do whatever you want, of course. So if you visit some websites that are not so well behaved, uh, you're risking of blocking the computer, opening a thousand windows, or yes, or slowing down your computer with, uh, I don't know, Bitcoin uh, mining code. And uh, that will run inside your browser without you knowing that and without you approving that. Yes, basically, we are, when we visit a web page, we are trusting. The developer of that web page uh, to give us to deliver us a, a friendly javascript and not an hostile javascript hmm. there are a lot of protection from a javascript not to access or not to modify other web pages in the same browser or other resources external to the browser so it cannot write or delete files on your computer but inside the page it can do basically whatever it wants um okay so what can we do uh with the, with the um, with the nodes that we got huh? okay uh first of all uh, we can once we have a node we can visit the nodes that are close to it so every node is a javascript object of course and it has some properties for example that it has properties for uh, getting the parent node for getting uh, the, the the siblings or the children there's a, an array called child nodes for every node that contains all the children of the node itself i hope we can see that in the inspector if it's still open yes uh, this node here okay if we go to the debugger we should be able to see this variable uh, okay where are they? okay the code is finished so i need to run it again so let's put a breakpoint here and run it again we load the page okay um so i have article title one article title two are variables and we can watch these variables and see that they have a lot of uh, attributes so these DOM nodes uh, really have hundreds of attributes each. Most of these attributes correspond, uh, most of the properties, the JavaScript properties, that they correspond to attributes in the HTML. Or, uh, and for example, the main section has ch children or child nodes. Child nodes is a collection of length one means that these only have one child and this child is a text node in for example you have a class list you have a list of children children is, the difference between child nodes and children is that children only contain elements while child nodes contains elements and text uh, we have attributes here we have an, a, a map of attributes. In this case, we only have one attribute called ID. So once we have the node, we can use a, a node, the node name dot attributes, and we have the list of all the attributes. Or dot children, we have the list of all the children. We can point to the, the first child and the last child. We have properties here, last child and first child, or the parent, p, 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 p parent node which is pointing to the main element okay so from one node we can easily move to the to the nodes close to it so we can navigate the dom just by 
proximity. Of course, we can do another query, query selector for getting the, the, the father or the children, but maybe locally we, we have an, I don't know, the, a row of a table and we want to navigate through all the cells of the table. So it's very easy to get the children of the row and they will be the, the data. Um, Alfredo, can we interact with PC when we use the debug in the browser? Okay, if right now we, I'm in the bug, so you see that the web page is, is in post state because I, I break point uh, on the page. Uh, right now we don't have any event lander set. Okay, so the only possibility is to break the code, uh, be, uh, stop the code before finishing the execution. Otherwise we are losing uh, the references of the variables. Uh, when we create event handlers, uh, we see that we can interact with the functions uh, also while the page is being shown. Um, the problem here is that, uh, uh, of course, if I stop in the JavaScript, the whole page is stopped. If I want to resume, of course, uh, the, the code will finish the execution. And so this variable with this function will be over. I don't have any, any more variables available here, but the page will be free. So whenever I, I'm breaking or I'm stopping the JavaScript, the page is frozen. You can interact with other pages, of course, with other, but that specific page is frozen. Um, and uh, we saw that uh, uh, every node has a lot of properties. All the attributes in the HTML are translated into properties. So if mm -hmm. we have the uh, an attribute called ID, then we will have a property called ID into that specific node. Uh, I don't know, a, a, an attribute of type, uh, an attribute checked will be mapped into an attribute checked of the object. So every attribute we put into the, um, the HTML, the source as an image source equal, we will have a dot source property in the HTML, of, in the DOM object, in the JavaScript object. So we have all the representation even without going into the, the attributes list, <clears throat> attributes are directly mapped as property in the object. So very, very convenient for that. And we can read them and we can modify them as we want. Mm -hmm. uh, or I can have also the, the, an API for reading and setting and uh, modifying the attributes uh, of an element. Uh, of every all the other of elements, there are a lot of methods really for working with these nodes. Um, we may also create uh, new elements. We can create an element, or we create a text node to add no, to populate new content on on, on our web page. Uh, just be aware that uh, creating an element doesn't add it to the page itself. It will create a separate fragment of HTML that can be added as a child to another element later on. So, for example, imagine we are trying to print the numbers 1 to 10 in our web page, for example, after the, the main title. So what, what I could do is to create 10 paragraphs uh, and uh, adding them as children of the main. So for example, I could add uh, four uh, at uh, i from zero to 10. Okay, we can create a new element, a new uh, paragraph, so we can document element of type P and I will add a so let P we can add this to the main so we can uh, get the, the main section document get uh, the selector main and the child, for example. So I'm creating a new element of type P and I'm appending it to the main selector. If I run this code, sorry, I need to remove the breakpoint. Okay. 
I will see that the main now has a, a set of para uh, empty paragraphs behind that because it just added that at the end as new children at the end of the, uh, of the list of children of the main, for example. If I want to put some number inside of them, I need to also add a text node, uh, let text is a document but create text node with a number of i for example so let's convert it to a string and we add new p append child of the text I create a text node. I append it to the P, and then I append the P to the uh, to the document. And so this sound happens like this: zero, one, two, three, up to ten. Okay. It's painful because you have to to build the page uh, one bit at a time, but we are mon manipulating, modifying the page after it has been loaded as we want. Uh, in this case, we are still in a synchronous way. It's not yet asynchronous. There are also uh, easier ways of doing that. So there are some properties for it's called one is called inner HTML. Okay, we have a, just a couple of slides quickly uh, with a lot of methods for adding, inserting, replacing before or after the nodes in the DOM. But uh, I was only well, I only want to mention this attribute inner HTML that already does most of the work for us okay uh, what we did here is uh, uh, create in HTML is a property of a node that contains all the HTML inside that node so the same result can also be done like this so I create did it, I did this in the, the right way but they can also do it in the, the quicker way by taking the main and uh, the inner HTML, which is a string that represents all the HTML inside the, the main tag. Okay. And I concatenate a new paragraph. Uh, and I write it in HTML. And uh, with the I uh, with the um, with the number side. So I I can rewrite or construct an HTML uh, fragment and put it inside an element. So we inside and this HTML can have many one or many uh, elements with children with the attributes or whatever I want. It will be passed and added to the document. So in this case. Uh, we will have another list of numbers here where the nodes, the actual nodes, the element node, the text nodes have been created, you know, automatically or by the browser just by parsing this code. So in many cases, if you want to rebuild some part of the page, it's better to have an HTML fragment and store it or add it as a, the inner HTML attribute. Or if you want to be precise, you need to create uh, the different nodes by hand, one by one. Um, Marco is asking, what if I want to put a bit a div between the second and third, third paragraph? Should I give it an ID to the paragraph? And this, uh, you can search, for example, for the third P and then, and then append a child with these methods. Uh, uh, like a, uh, there are methods to append in the middle of a, of a, of a sequence. Okay. Um, so before the first one, after the first one, you can append at the end or in the middle. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, of details that we can, the, the easiest one is just redefining the inner HTML and then it's a bit slower because the browser needs to read and reparse the HTML, but it's much easier. Or uh, just insert 
addition to HTML, so uh, so it can be inserted uh, in uh, in different places without modifying the the surrounding text and so on. Um, is the p tag which automatically has the slash n to the end of the line uh, the p tag goes uh, creates a new paragraph in the page here uh, there is no real new line here actually if i if i wanted to see the web page the source sorry the source can be seen because the source is there but uh, they will be all, all together okay the fact that here we, they are in separate lines is just the, the inspector that will show them in this way. Huh? But if I want to, to convert this into HTML, they will be all, uh, all, all joined together. Hmm. I don't know if I can see the inner HTML of the main. No main element. in well okay you see it oh, there is no new line in this, in this file okay time for a break uh let's answer a couple of questions uh, uh, we are adding a web page without javascript code or where can we use our code to parse a web page is it possible to insert javascript code into another web page instead of using the, the, the debugger uh the javascript code of, of one page cannot see or parse the the the, 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 the html of another web page mm -hmm. or so you what you should do if i understood your question is to use your your javascript to load an external web page as a string and then do your own processing but this page will not be part of the browser the browser will not allow you to access an external, an external page unless you're writing a plugin for the browser then you have a special access to the content of course okay may I suggest uh, having a break of 15 minutes so that uh, we can then move on uh to to uh, to, uh, 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 to the most uh, say interesting part which is how to handle the asynchronous part of the events okay uh, so we can break for 15 minutes uh, and start again at 10 30 right okay nobody's against that so i take that as a yes <laughs> 